And let's let's start the panel discussion. So I would ask Yuya, Timothy, and Isaac on the stage, please, on the stage, please, to discuss um, different views, I would say, and different use cases. It's, it's a wide variety this time, really from the trying to get people to use it, individuals that use it, that use get Annex in, in a variety of ways, and the implementation, the centralized implementation of a decentralized tool. So are there any questions for, for all of them, for individuals um, to discuss? Um, oh, yeah. uh, for for Yulia, you were talking about how originally um, there was this data lad gin component to the infrastructure you had built, and that eventually this was too complicated, so you went for a simpler model. But that some people were indeed using gin and data lad. Uh, what happened to them? Um, yeah, so like I said, I mean, they can continue using uh, data lab, but uh, they will eventually have to transfer their data to the Git lab then. Oh, okay, so they just have no choice. They... No, we okay. have to. No, no, it's, it's fine. No, can, I like... mean, we have to shut it down because we just can't then like handle two instances uh, and maintain them. And then if something goes wrong, like at, at some point, the, the version of Chin we have doesn't is not compatible with the mm -hmm. version of data lab anymore or something like that. So that would not be good for them. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. I will point out, luckily for them, they can um, just use the fact that GitNX can store data in a um, in a GitLFS repository, so they can then store it there. Uh, <laughs> um, I actually wanted to comment on that too. I think, um, you know, I've, for example, I follow people who do game development. They all use GitLFS, and they use it for very specific reasons. They need the ability to um, lock a file and say, "I'm editing." this image, you know, I'm, a, I'm an art, I'm an artist, I'm adjusting the art here. I don't want anybody else to be messing with my art with this file. Um, so I think that these, you know, there are the, all these different use cases and it's really important to meet the user's use case need. And so I'm, you know, I appreciate <laughs> hearing too much complexity, move to something simpler. I think it's, it's very reasonable. <laughs> Yeah, also uh, to you, yeah, the, uh, first of all, it's impressive uh, what you're running there with the resources that you have. And uh, I can tell from experience that that just getting the PIs in a room doesn't solve the thing. And <laughs> and the, the, like, the, the only, <laughs> it makes it worse, yeah. But the, the and I think uh, what resonated with me is, and it's great the way you reflect on uh, on, on on all of this, and the uh, um, the the demand aspect, like solving an actual need that was also expressed in, in in earlier talks, is from my perspective the only thing that works, right? And and so I I think what you did there in in order of uh, to assess the situation, uh, that would be nice to see on the outside, because like in all the plannings of all the similar information management projects in, in other CRCs, they all have the same problem. And and I would suspect that the infrastructures being built have some sort of cognitive dissonance uh, compared to, uh, to the needs. And I also have a question, uh, which is when you settle on Git LF, uh, LFS, um, how do you deal with the, something needs to be deleted? in LFS, is that, uh, do you know if that's still a thing? Because I, I think that that was the problem, right? You can't delete things. Well, can you just create it, you have to delete all of it? Right, like I, I don't think that's what you're officially supposed to do, but I have had repos that have had LFS content, and if you delete the whole thing and then. Yeah, right, but so that's also the recommendation if you look on the GitHub documentation, right? But what okay. we're talking about here is there's a central instance, which is the instance of the data, right? And if you want to delete a thing, you would have to have another copy in order to recreate that. And I think that's an infrastructural challenge. Um, I don't know how to deal uh, with that yet. We actually don't expect 
um, the researchers to use Git LFS that much because, like I said, the people that are dealing with uh, big data, they, um, yeah, it's first very um, few researchers and uh, those um, actually um, wanted to use data lab uh, and stuff. So I think maybe it's just easier for them to like keep uh, doing that and um, yeah, so I don't know how to deal with that yet. Stefan, do you? <laughs> yeah, to my knowledge, Git LFS has a mechanism that um, frees you of data that co it considers to be old, like data that is not um, in a currently checked out branch and is older than some criterion yet that you can set. And those data you can kind of drop but it's not quite the same, so so it's lacking a bit of these sweet features that Git Annex has. Yeah. Um, I had a so Timothy, you had mentioned um, basically you're talking about trust. Well, you're talking about using, um, you know, like ZFS or Bet BetterFS, and you said that maybe Git Annex's concept of trust levels needed to be increased in some way. So I was curious what your, I mean, what, you know, it's either trusted or it's not particularly trusted is the current distinction. Do, do you have a further distinction there or? Well, I, oh, right, <laughs> sorry. I think it goes along with um, how FSCK works, and I, I think the simplest solution, because you're right, I, it should be either trusted or untrusted, but it might be good to expose that, so maybe uh, on a per machine or per repo level, you could have some kind of helper script that could check and see if what the conditions are. You're thinking like a dynamically, like if it's if it's hosted on this file system, I trust it. Well, and and the th that gets even a little bit more complicated, which is why uh, because I looked into that, and you have to make sure that, because both of those file systems won't, it's not guaranteed that they've actually checked some of them, and it's not guaranteed, so you have to double check some things, but, that, but that's why if it were, if that mechanism were, if that git annex plumbing were exposed a bit more, then that could be doable. Okay. Um, and, and also, like, uh, with something like, a trusted cloud hosting service, I can just check that the file is there and it hasn't changed. It's good enough for me that, like, I don't think it's going to be deleted necessarily. Right, I mean, that's the, I mean, I don't know if people are really familiar with Git Annex Trust. I don't know that it's something that people here use, but the key thing is that you can't delete it behind your back. You can't have, a, in a distributed situation, you can't have, um, you know, over here, the, it gets deleted from the trusted repository and over here they're trusting it. So they delete their last copy of it. So uh, I don't know. I don't know if it matters if it's on ButterFS or not. You could still have that situation, right? I was actually wondering if it was more like a num copies kind of thing. If you're having, um, well, at least ZFS, you have you know you have a RAID kind of situation. So you you kind of might say you have more than one copy of a file. ButterFS does too. Okay, so. Yeah, so I was kind of one. I've I've been pondering this, you know, should maybe some of these situations count as more than one copy question, and I yeah. Every time I thought about it, it ends up getting getting a bit complicated because you know you yes. when you when you uh, do a fast FSCK, yeah. you're, you the Git NX there is still only just checking the existence of the file, mm -hmm. and you know you could record when the last well it does record when the last time it was fully checked was. Mm -hmm. um, I would say if there's one thing that could really help, it would just be to uh, add a little bit of flexibility to that, and then, so, that, that's all. Um, all right, just there was a comment from the internet to the um, GitLab uh, LFS uh, instant that GitLab can remove files that are unreachable, basically, but there's no um, solution really to splitting data about different remotes, and that's what DataLad is actually doing and other solutions. So there was another question. Yeah. Please. Um, 
Yes, regarding uh, Git LFS, I think not being able to delete stuff from LFS is a GitHub specific thing. And um, you can do it in GitLab, but it's more like removing stuff from the Git history proper. So you have to uh, rewrite the history. Mm. Um, and I have a question to Isaac. Um, how easy is it to get into uh, the Stata led registry with your own sort of repository? So we have. Uh, yeah, uh, a service uh, which is similar to Jin. It's Gitty with Git Annex support. Uh, how easy would it be to get indexed there? Uh, I would say that it's extremely easy. So if you check out our repo, and basically you can, the current description is uh, basically allowed, because it's still in, um, I would say, the beginning of development stage. Um, we only put up uh, instruction for setting up how to test the, the project and also how to do it in development mode. But actually, if you just twist a little bit, it's going to, uh, the development mode, just make sure that you, you set it instead of development mode, uh, the set, the, follow the exact instruction for development mode, but then you do it in, uh, make sure that you set, uh, instead of development, you set the parameter for, um, for production. That's basically it. It's just file up all the apartment container we we'll use Portman, but actually, if you want, you have access. Access you can use um, Docker container as you work as well. So, just uh, basically Docker compose or Portman compose, and then bring all those. Uh, just specify the uh, compose file, and then all service will be up. And the only thing you need to do is just adjust some of those uh, parameters in uh, environment file. For example, your 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 secret you know, the password and stuff like that. And you should have it going in no time. If you have any problem, just send us uh, an email or file an issue. Did you want your own instance of register or just? Did you want your own instance or you just wanted to register your URLs uh, to our I'm instance? in your instance, so. Oh, okay. Uh, file an issue against data led usage dashboard and say where they are and how to discover them. So we'll add it to data led usage dashboard and then registry automatically would pretty much pick it, pick it up, I would say. Uh, yes, currently is that we don't allow, the, the function if you run your own instance, you can register your own URL. For example, if you have something that is not, a uh, data set that is not, you don't want to disclose to the internet, of the public, you can run your local one. You you just run it locally, okay? Any if even file directory, you can specify as you know, like within the same machine. So um, the the registry will do the extraction for you and all those uh, uh, cloning and keeping the 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 um, any update will be you know reflected in the instance. Uh, if you wanted to have your own instance of uh, the, uh, the catalog, uh, how easy and what would be the easier way to actually implement something that uh, uh, does uh, access control? Uh, like, you know, the, these, these users can access those data sets, these users can access those data sets. Uh, uh, I mean, what's, what we need framework for that? Uh, Are you talking about registry? Uh, yeah. Uh, current, I don't think we currently have those that support yet, right? No, no, I, I know. I mean, I'm just thinking ahead. Like, you know, if you were to to add a layer on the top of the registry that does this kind of service, I mean, uh, do you think there would be an easy way of implementing that? Yes, eventually we we plan to add something like that. But uh, currently, it's not at this point. It's not our priority. Um, Hi. Uh, same same thing in the same vein. I, I think it would be really useful to have this kind of personal dashboard almost of all of the kind of data lab projects and mm -hmm. subdirectories. And I guess it would work with a sub uh, what are they called sub data sets as well, right? You would just see them in a list if you, for example, have a private instance. Yes. And I was really struck by your one screenshot where you had this overview of, um, I think, just queries of file sizes and so on. And I actually thought it would be great to have if if for example, you take a heavily modularized data set to have a template where you say, okay, I would never want to encode anything larger than this. Give me a warning or at least 
give me give me some information. I know that you, of course, have the specification file where you say, okay, anything that is larger than this goes into the annex or something like this. But I think that's also quite obstructed, right, to the to the end user. You really have to go into these files and look at it. And I actually like this web interface of saying, you know, how big would you like to have the files be? Like basically you create like a specification sheet on the web or something like that, that is true for the whole project or for all of your projects and then that automatically gets uh, taken in. Uh, are you talking about like searching for particular one that within a particular size or are you talking about? It's basically inverting the thing, right? So you're basically having a query Mm -hmm. I, I'm pointing at nothing now. Uh, mm -hmm. You're basically having a query, but you could also just take that in as a as a kind of read-in form, almost the mm -hmm. the stuff that you have designed, mm -hmm. to set up just the specification files in the first place. Once you're creating the data set, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I'm really thinking of it in in the broader context, also zooming out a bit as a kind of dashboard, right, where you can inspect what you already have done, but you can also start planning your upcoming data sets that you want to create. Okay. Just, just an idea. But I, I think it's really cool and I think it's really useful. Thanks. Thank you. Any more questions? Maybe you have questions as well for the others. Feel free. Uh, yes, just uh, we, we, are, we, we are still in the initial development stage. So if you guys have any idea about where do you want this project to go and useful to you, please let us know. Um, uh, to that, uh, Isaac, perhaps I missed it, but uh, have you uh, considered uh, um, incorporating uh, license information somehow? And if yes, uh, have you thought about a standard uh, to parse um, in uh, adding license information to the data sets? Is there some kind of recommendation for license information on uh, data led um, data sets? I think I would defer that particular question to Yarek since he's the, the one directing this project. <clears throat> Different data set level formats, right? Standards, they mandate where to place the license, right? So let's say in bits, I think we have license file right there. I don't remember if bits validator reads it out, but it will be a job for some metadata extractor. And you could create your own metadata extractor, which say, you know, license gatherer, right, of some kind, which will extract, like given a data set, I know that I should look for a license in those locations, I parse them out, and you load that into the JSON record, and then it would be visible right there. So you just need to create that extractor and give trigger points like when to run it, if it finds license file, let's say. And then it will be automatically gathering it. Uh, different systems have different locations were to put those. Let's say Debian package will have Debian copyright, right? So again, it, it's a job of some metadata extractor. Registry has nothing to do with it. You create that extractor, place it into some toolkit, we include it in data led registry to load it, and that's an extractor for metadata. Make sense? Very Maybe on top of that, um, the the schema that I mentioned yesterday has places uh, to do that. So if you if you have a, a an SPDX listed license, I don't know if you know that there's a long page that has all the sensible licenses, and um, so you can s simply identify them this way, and then it would go through the pipe uh, that Yarek just mentioned to end up in the in the registry. On top of that, if you have more complicated things to explain, uh, there is the open uh, rights description language. It's also a W3C uh, a document that where you can say things like, this group of people are allowed to do X, Y, Z with this parts of the, of the data set. So it's fairly comprehensive. So Timothy, I was wondering, since you, in your introduction, it, you were, you said that you had uh, worked on the sold house, which I don't know if people here know the TV show. It's fairly famous in the U.S. Uh, Bob Villa, I, yeah. So, so what's it like to work on a TV show and use Git Annex in some way? I mean, well, um, <coughs> uh, we handled all of the video processing for. Um, 
the from the closed captioning and metadata uh, for syndication all over the world and on all of our different channels. And in terms of Git Annex, uh, it was, and in terms of a lot of it, it was um, just I, I solved the problem. Um, I would have loved to have uh, integrated the rest of IT with that more. Um, and I would have loved to have been able to, internally I did set up some pipelines. I would have loved if more uh, could have been done with that. But yeah, this old house was uh, really interesting. I got to meet everybody except Bob Vila. He, um, he retired and, and he doesn't, uh, he's not involved anymore. But I, I, the whole, I worked in Connecticut and the whole house it's filmed in New Hampshire, and uh, so, yeah. So what kind of problem did you solve exactly? Well, uh, one, problem, uh, one problem which I used just Git for was closed captioning and metadata. That was done by uh, um, interns, and there are huge fines for getting that wrong. And there, are, uh, if what I used Git Annex for was keeping, we had very big files that needed to be processed and just keeping track of where they were and you know stuff like that uh, and making sure that there was integrity you'd be you would think that uh, there would be um, more uh, integrity and verification but even in uh, a business um, the incentive is always to make things as efficient and cheap as possible so sometimes you would have a big file on an HFS drive and it would just have bit rot and so, um, yeah. They got acquired by Roku, and uh, I believe they, uh, may, they, they cut things even more after I left. I have another question for Julia. Um, the teaching material you were relating to, um, my question is how did you set it up? Did you um, base it on some of the data stuff? And I would say let's, let's share what we have on, on teaching because it's, it's a hard job, as we heard from different people. And I think the collaborative effort could really help. Um, the tutorial for data lab, I actually didn't really uh, finish in the end because then we just made this one on one support with the people who actually were using um, data lab and with the other stuff like Git and GitLab, I just based it on all the YouTube videos that are already existing and just like put together what I thought was uh, important for our researchers and like. Uh, I don't know, told a story around it that related to their work, but basically, I mean, everything's there. <laughs> so, but it's all on our Nova website and uh, accessible for everyone right, at great. any time. Yeah, thanks. I mean, it's really hard. I think it would be interesting later as well, maybe the conference, to get the people that are trying to teach it and maybe fail or not fail to get together. I said that already, but I think it's a very important. Are there any other? Questions to one of the panelists? If not now or in public, um, feel free to just approach them as everyone here. I mean, you know that already. Thanks for uh, the session now, and let's have some lunch and keep on talking. <laughs>